Welcome to the Next Level Income Show, where it's our goal to raise your income, your investments, and your life to the next level. I'm your host, Chris Larson. You can get a free copy of our book at nextlevelincome.com. Just click on the book link. You are not going to want to miss today's show with Bobby Casey of Global Wealth Protection. Bobby's going to talk about the best countries in the world to live for asset protection, for taxes, what countries handled COVID situation the best, and where you want to live if you're looking to increase your after-tax income and your quality of life. On today's show, we have Bobby Casey. Bobby is the Managing Director of Global Wealth Protection. He has helped many entrepreneurs to minimize taxes, protect assets, and most importantly, open the doors to a digital nomad lifestyle. Bobby, welcome to the show. Hey, Chris, thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm. Hey, I'm. I'm surprised I got you in one place <laughs> in North Carolina here. Um, so we're actually yeah. in the same state for this recording because you you've been you've been all over the world uh, even during the pandemic. Which I'd love to have you share more with the audience about that. But before we do, sure. I guess tell tell our audience a little bit more about yourself, Bobby, um, as well as your company, Global Wealth Protection, and really wh what you do. Okay. Um, about myself, I like long walks on the beach, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. Um, seriously, no, I'm, I'm a lifelong entrepreneur. Um, I'm 40, wait, seven, yeah, seven years old. I haven't, I've actually never had a professional job. The last any job I had, I was 19 years old. Um, so, of course, I didn't have a professional job when I was 18, 19 years old. I've always had my own businesses. I've started various businesses over the years. Um, and really what got me in the field I'm in now, and I'll get into that in a second, but basically what got me in the field I'm in now is actually growing up as the son and a grandson of an entrepreneur. My grandpa and my uncle had a chain of restaurants when I was actually before I was born and he retired actually before I was born. And then my dad had a construction company and a, uh, real estate development company. Uh, you know, all through my, actually my whole life, my, uh, until he sold out, he sold the business some, I don't know, probably 20, 20, 25 years ago. And so growing up in that entrepreneurial household, for me, it was never kind of a thing to go get that corporate job. It was never even like a mindset that I had that that's what needs to happen. And so for, to extent, I'm fortunate. I didn't have that. I mean, I think about people that like go that path and get the, uh, um, you know, go through the education and get the corporate job and all that stuff. And I think like, imagine, like, I think about those people that get making hundred, 150 or $200,000 a year in, in their thirties. They're like, you know what? I'm going to walk away from this. And I think that must be exceptionally difficult for somebody in that position. I, um, I did it. And I'll tell you what, I, you know, not to cut you off here, I'll let you pick back sure. up. But I'll tell you when you do that for, for, in my case, it was 18 years of being a professional in the medical device industry. I got to the number, I got to the financial piece, the passive income that I needed to get to. My CPA looked at me, he's like, what are you waiting for? You don't need to do this anymore. But it had become, it had become such a part of me. And I had, I had such anxiety to walk away. I took a trip down sure. the Grand Canyon three years ago. And my biggest a source of anxiety wasn't, Hey, you might die in the river, Chris, in the Canyon, in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> it was, what, what are you going to do if you can't check your email? It's really crazy what it does to your brain. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 well, I have the email too, but still, you know, and I think like those people like you, like that must be like a, a com incredibly difficult thing to walk away from that career. I, like I said, I never had that because I never, went in that path. And so I don't really understand what that feels like. And I was actually talking to my youngest son about this the other day. I've never had a steady paycheck ever, like ever my whole life. And so it's a completely different way of thinking about things. And so for me, it was just growing up as an entrepreneur. My dad was also uh, a, a trained. So, you know, our normal dinner time conversations when I'm 12 years old are about, um, you know, tax planning, company structure and, uh, you know, tax minimization and, you know, optimization topics, yeah, you know, I'd super love, exciting when you're 12, I, right? I'll tell you what, he's always invited over to my house for dinner. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, so, 
going through my my entrepreneurial career, had a few different businesses, but in my late twenties, I got to the point where I thought, you know, I need to do something different. Like I, my my fr- from a financial standpoint, I need to do a bit more tax planning and asset protection planning because I had some I had a, a decent size like a uh, company that was doing like upper seven figures, close to eight figures. And then I had some bunch of real estate. I had, I actually owned a restaurant at one point in my twenties, late twenties. And I thought I got to do something. So I ended up hiring somebody like me back then to do what I do for people now with asset protection and, and planning and street planning for their business and taxes and stuff. And that's actually what got me started on that path is the guy that I met who actually is still a mentor of mine to this day. We still talk every couple of months. Sometimes we collaborate on a client project or something, but I, at that point in my life, all my friends were entrepreneurs. I didn't really have friends you know, that had normal corporate jobs, everyone I knew and hung out with had their own business, you know, and so that's just how my network evolved. And so I started doing some consulting at that point for helping them, you know, kind of optimize their own situation. And it kind of grew. So that's been like 20 years ago. And it kind of grew progressively from there. And then I ended up selling a few different businesses. And then I saw business in 2000 seven or eight, I forget, 2007 or eight, I sold a business and I thought, oh, what do I really want to do? And, and I thought, you know, I really love dealing with entrepreneurs. I love the freedom of location independence and I love the clients that I'm working with. I've got a bit of money. I don't really need to like grind for a paycheck every week. And so, so that's when I kind of officially started doing what I'm doing now. And this is really what I've been doing since like, well, unofficially since like two years, but officially since about 2008, this is what I've been doing. And so what we do now is uh, like my tagline is uh, tax and residency planning for location independent entrepreneurs. Um, we help people internationalize their business, their wealth and their life. And, you know, a lot of it's tax planning, a lot of it's, you know, optimizing company structure and how to, you know, a lot of it's multi-jurisdictional planning as well. Like right before our call here, I just, I was on the phone. Look like this is just an example of my every day. I had a Turkish guy living in Canada with a business partner who is a Turkish guy living in Singapore. um, And they're uh, they're software developers developing video games. And we discussed on how and where to structure their business to optimize it for tax planning and asset protection. It's a, it. a, a very normal conversation I have like yeah. every day, that type of thing. So, and it. those things get complicated. Those things Absolutely, get really yeah. complicated, right? You know, like I've got a, a, a German client with a, with a huge e-commerce business selling primarily in the North American markets and he lives in, in Thailand, you know? So wow. those things get, yeah. those things get complicated. Yeah. So that's basically what I do now. Yeah. Well, and I, I think um, I want to dive more into that. You know, the pandemic, it's been really interesting. So my wife and I have a short-term rental Airbnb that we run. And, you know, we've had some people here recently that come through and like, hey, we can, you know, we can work from wherever. We're going to, we're going to live here for a week or two and, you know, kind of explore, yeah. explore the Asheville area. So we've seen the rise of the digital nomad over the past year. Yeah. And it seems like the pandemic has really opened people's eyes. If, if somebody's listening today and really doesn't know what a digital nomad is, but, uh, Bobby, you kind of, can you share more about that? And, you know, it seems like you, you're like one of the original digital nomads. <clears throat> I've been location independent really my whole life. Even when I had yeah. an office, even when I had an office years ago, um, I mean, actually, technically I have two offices now. I've got one in Arizona and one in the Caribbean. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think I've been to the one in the Caribbean in three or four years. One in Arizona I've been to once this year. So okay. I don't really go to the office, but before, like I used to have an office, like 20 employees physically. Yeah. In the and the joke was when I showed up, like the receptionist would say like, hi, how may I help you? Like, cause I, I had an office at home and you know, my dad would always call me cause at yeah. one point my dad was my CFO. When he retired, he became my CFO. Oh, cool. yeah. And um, dad would call me, are you going to work today? And I'm like, dad, I'm working. I'm at home working. 
yeah, but you can't work when you're at home. You weren't here at the office at 7.30. And that was always the, the thing with him, you know, a bit old school that you've got to be in the yeah. suit and tie yeah. at your desk by 8 a.m., that sort of thing. But I, for digital nomad thing, I personally think started about 15 years ago when Skype was created. Because I remember my first trip to Russia back in – it was a – about 2005 or six or something like 2005 or six. I came home and my cell phone bill was like two grand and I only had a few Ooh, yeah, phone I calls. That. I remember that when it was, yeah, it was ridiculous, you know, stupid um, money, like 10 yeah. bucks a minute or something like that yeah. for, you know, I'm home on my, my phone bill was like two grand, but then Skype started and people's like, it just dramatically opened up the world for small business people and free. Like if you're a big company, it's not a big deal. You make a 30 minute phone call to Europe or, or Asia. But if you're a, a freelancer and you've got a client, like let's say you're, um, you know, you do video editing, freelancing, you know, for marketing stuff for people and you've got clients in Asia, what are you going to do? Like you've, you're going to have your phone calls with at 10 bucks a minute. No. Yeah. And so Skype to me opened up the world. It was kind of the, the catalyst that opened up the world for global cheap, free or cheap communication. Um, and so I think it really started about then. And then I also think Tim Ferriss's book, um, four hour work week. Yeah. Four hour work week yeah. was a big catalyst for yeah. a lot of people. Um, oh yeah, I was. That was. In, I mean, Rich Dad Poor Dad, Four Hour Work Week. I mean, these are books that I read, and I was like, oh yeah, it kind of puts that imprint in your brain, and it really, yeah. you know, being in sales, you know, I was, you know, it's a very entrepreneurial <clears throat> endeavor, and I didn't want to be tied down to where I wanted to live, but yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I remember my first Skype call with my son. I was in Colorado, right. you know, a cycling event. I was like, this is amazing. You know, mm -hmm. here's a year old, and I'm looking at him on the camera. But so now, but but that type of stuff that opened up the world for, you know, small business people, freelancers or small entrepreneurs, solopreneurs yeah. that actually have clients all over the world. It also opened it up that, you know, like the work week, he talked a lot about, you know, kind of do your job remotely and kind of go live your best life in Bali or something like that. Right. Yeah. And, but that was, you know, very difficult. It, prior to Skype. And so a lot of things have been up since then. So now you've got digital nomad. It's a pretty broad term. I mean, it, it can be anywhere from, you know, what we generally call the coconut cowboys, the, the young guys that make $700 a month and decide they want to go live a really cheap life and just party all the time. And they can do that sort of stuff like in cheap places in Thailand and, you know, Vietnam and other parts of South Asia but that still falls under the digital nomad category. You've got freelancers, you've got solopreneurs, um, you've got people run really big businesses that just have built, you know, remote teams. Um, you got people that have remote jobs now. I mean, my God, yeah. I think, was it like a month ago, General Motors announced all their office workers are fully remote. They sent 30,000 people home. When you've got Amazing. some of the yeah. huge stalwarts of, industry sending all their office people home like clearly remote work trend right like oh yeah on. well what's interesting is apple i don't know if you saw this here it might have been this morning but tim cook said hey you got to come back in the office three i think it's like three days a week and at, the apple employees revolted against him i they wouldn't said, surprise me uh -uh. they said no no like you can't make us do this so it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting one of the other interesting things i've seen here bobby love to get your uh your thoughts on this i've seen i've seen a business where you can go live on a cruise ship if you're if you're you know um you know as you said digital nomads kind of world broad, cruise yeah is that what it's called, called? world cruise yeah yeah tell you know tell, tell us more about that <clears throat> there was a guy down in panama who parked the ship yeah. Uh, in in the in, but he got shut actually oh okay i think that's the story i read that's the one you read probably um he Thanks. actually bought a ship or was working on buying a ship and they were parking it um in the port in panama city yeah. and it was not going to move it was going to be parked and people could buy their cabins or yep. multiple cabins and live actually got yeah. shut down um i've talked to that guy he got shut down because um insurance he couldn't find an insurance company that it would insure the project because they didn't know what to do with it. It's like housing 
but on the water. And there's an engine that? there, but it's yeah. the boat's not going anywhere. And so they had they knew how to insure a boat that's traveling. They knew how to insure a house, but they don't know how to insure a boat that doesn't move, right? So how about um, that? Yeah. That one got shut down. But there is world cruise, like people live on cruise ships. Yeah. They do, 12 month cruises. You, you actually buy your cabin or you can rent it also. Yeah. Um, and you can get on and off wherever the ship, you know, docks at a port. So like you could get off the boat in Barcelona yeah. and decide, okay, I'm going to stay in Barcelona for a month. And then let's say the next port is, uh, I don't know, somewhere in Asia, you get on yeah. a plane and fly to that port and then you get back, back on, on the, the boat, boat again. Yeah. That's pretty, that's pretty wild. Yeah. I mean, as our kids get a little bit older here, um, you know, they'll be graduating in the next decade. I'm starting to talk to my wife about some of these different concepts. And um, it's interesting to think about what's possible. I did a cruise uh, about a year and a half ago um, called Nomad Cruise. Um, so it's a cruise just for digital nomads. It was a two-week yeah. cruise that went from uh, Barcelona to uh, Barcelona, Spain to Recife in, uh, in Brazil. So it was a one-way yeah. one cruise for about two yeah. weeks. I did that. It was a pretty cool event. Um, yeah. Johannes is the guy who runs that thing. Yeah. And I did uh, a, a keynote presentation on the cruise for this type of stuff for the yeah. tax and residency planning. And yeah. it was a great, great event. It was super fun. Of course, they killed it shortly after that. But uh, Johannes said they're, they're relaunching it. I think January or February 2022, they're going to do another one. Um, oh, awesome. So yeah. that'd be kind of fun if you're interested. And it's a cool event with cool people. Yeah. Um, so that's a nice thing, but digital nomads is, is definitely a, a, a growing trend that technology has made available to us. And I, I joke, we actually wrote an article about this last year on our blog and, uh, Oh, I got so much heat for this, but I loved it. It was, um, basically I said, uh, uh, COVID was the best thing to happen for humanity. Um, because basically what, what, it, what happened during COVID is from a worker perspective, everyone, I mean, got sent home or not, everyone, but a lot of people got sent home. If you were able to work remotely, they did it, right? Yeah. And so what happened then is it exposed people to the idea that why am I commuting an hour to work every day? Why am I even doing that? Yeah. And things like, this I commute two hours every day, like this wasted time sitting in the car. Um, why would I not just work from home and then take a long lunch break, lunch with my kids or, yeah. or go to the gym and exercise or, you know, maybe cut my work time down a little bit and have a side hustle where I make some yeah. extra money, you know, and they realize like actually working from home, a lot of people realized eight hour work day really only has about four hours of work in it. That's right. And I think, I think that we probably have three to four hours of concentrated, you know, mental energy every day anyway. And that's, yeah. that seems to be, I mean, it, it's all these studies that come out. It seems to be that, I mean, my, my wife and I, we get up at five o'clock, we work for a couple hours, get the kids, you know, going, doing their thing. They work for a little bit more work out. And I mean, we, we're, we're as productive as we want to be. And it's, you know, certainly, you know, this is an N equal one study here, but it certainly works in our case. Um, so, you know, I agree. It's like people have seen, seen the light, right? It's like, what am I doing? Why, why am I living in the Northeast? I have a coaching client. Uh, he lives in New York and um, he's, he's, taking a, a, he's um, taking a promotion with a different company and it's 100%, 100% virtual. So he can work wherever he wants. And he's talking about moving to the Carolinas. He's like, why would I live in a high tax state with this crappy Absolutely. weather when I can live in a, a low tax state with, with great weather, you know, live at the beach. I'll, t I'll take you, I'll take it a step further. Why not? Just I want to hear it. Mex take it a step further and go live on the beach in Mexico where yeah. the cost of living is a third what it is in North Carolina with a very high quality. Life. And essentially you can make a, well, Depends on the, your tax situation and how you earn your income, but you can make at least $150,000 tax-free living in Mexico. $150,000 tax-free. So Mexico- As an American. I'm as an speaking American. about American because you mentioned gotcha. the guy from yeah. New York. Yeah. So 
so basically there's a if you're an american citizen and you live abroad and you meet the the requirement for the foreign earned income exclusion you get about 110,000 in uh tax free income plus about 40,000 in a housing allowance. so about about 150,000 you can earn tax free um there's other things you can do if you make more but it's yeah. really simple to do the foreign income exclusion and earn about 150 tax free so i would say for yeah. for your coaching client I would skip all the way past North Carolina and go to Mexico. Just keep flying. <laughs> yeah. I I'd love keep it. going. Yeah. yeah. So, all right. So, we're going to get into the nitty gritty here a little bit, Bobby. I think that's a good transition. So, Mexico, what are some other countries around the world that, that are favorites of yours right now as far as, you know, if you're, if you're an American, you know, most of our listeners are in America. We have some in Canada, a couple international, you know, that pop up. Um, but, you know, if, if you're listening, what are some of your favorite countries around the world to check out right now? You know, I mean, it's tough right now because you got so many countries with so many COVID restrictions. It makes it makes it complicated. Got it. Um, okay, I mean, so wait, not, kind of push not, those aside a little bit. Well, so like for example, what I'm saying in, in the West Hemisphere, you know, the yeah. Americas. If you go um, south of the U.S., yep. The only, the only two countries I would consider living in. Um, Outside of the Caribbean, I'm excluding the Caribbean here, but outside of the Caribbean, okay. the only two countries I consider living in are Mexico and Brazil. Okay. Um, because the, the, their behavior during this COVID situation, for most of those countries has been atrocious. Like, Pan, like Panama, yeah. for example, um, you could only go outside for months and months. You could only go outside for two hours a day, two days a week, four hours a week. You can physically be outside of your home. Like, yeah. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to stay inside where COVID transmission rates are, are sky high, basically exclusively in indoors. Yeah. That's, that's insane. Yeah. I mean, don't, don't worry. The U S is, the U S is not uh, immune from stupidity too. Right. Last year, <laughs> like they closed the national parks. I did a, my wife and I did an RV trip last year for a few weeks in the States. And ironically, almost all of your states had their state parks open, yeah. but federally the national parks were closed because apparently COVID only appears on federal owned property, That's right. not state property. <laughs> right. Because yeah, well, what's better yeah. than staying inside and, and, you know, yeah. <laughs> breathing COVID air, I guess, than going outside and going hiking in a national. Oh, park. there's so many, yeah, there's so many idiotic things that occurred. Um, yeah, our kids went back to school, but not on Wednesdays. I guess that's the only day COVID got transmitted. Well, COVID I just, on Wednesdays, I heard. It just, it, it's, it's a bad day. It's hump day. Um, yeah, COVID's, it's a little... COVID's bad after like 11 p.m. too, apparently, because a lot of people <laughs> have that 11 p.m. curfew now, so COVID gets uh, terrible. Yeah, like, so, well... <laughs> I think we could we could spend a whole show um, yep. panning the responses to COVID here, especially in retrospect. And um, absolutely, but I, I think you make a great point. I think I think like again to your point, you know, COVID really shed light on the the way countries, the way businesses, weaknesses. We, absolutely weaknesses. Um, you look at schools now. I was reading an article here this past week. Um, school attendance in the county is down fifteen hundred students, and the county is now concerned about getting funds, federal funds for schooling. And I, my, my first thought was, where, where do those students go? And my belief is that a lot of them went to private schools that stayed open and took, took different approaches to this situation. Right. So, you know, it, it's interesting to see the way these behaviors have occurred. So Mexico, Brazil, and South America. Um, That's it. In, in, south yeah. of the U.S., excluding yeah. Caribbean. I would only consider Mexico and Brazil because – Every other country had an unbelievably ridiculous, different in different ways, but those are the only two that had a type of semblance of rationality in their, yeah. in their, in their behavior, their response to COVID. Like, Panama was terrible. Like, a lot of people, especially digital nomads, they talk about Colombia. I love Colombia. Yeah. You know, Medellin's great. I, I mean, I've, I've lived in Medellin. I used to have property there. And... Um, you know, Bogota is a cool city, but my God, Colombia's response to COVID was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Curfews. Um, if you had a job, you had to have a permit to go to that job. And 
not only a permit to go to the job, but a permit on how you got to the job. Wow. Like actually wow. the path you took to get there. Like, and you, if you strayed off your path, you could get fined or whatever. I mean, just some craziness. So this side, I would like the, some parts of the U S have been reasonable. Some mm-hmm. parts not. Um, so some parts of the U S could be okay. Yes. Yeah, so I'll, 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 I'll take the handcuffs off. Yeah. What, what were your favorite, uh, what are your favorite places in the country with respect to, you know, uh, responses and, you know, future, you know, as far as you look at, like, say the next uh, 20 years. In the U S in the U S yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think the clear trend is getting a, away from big cities. Um, so LA, New York, I mean, New York's a ghost town yeah. now. It's, oh yeah. Right? It's insane. Yeah. Um, so any of your big cities, I would, I would avoid, um, countryside yeah, there are places i believe it or not like arkansas i think is really interesting it's very rural but they've yeah. got a lot of nice beautiful nature mountains oh, yeah. it's really nice um if you don't mind the dry heat i think arizona is a great option because their beer was quite good yeah um and now arizona or sorry arkansas i'll rewind i think some of their beer was pretty stupid However, it's countryside, and so the people in the countryside didn't actually care or listen. Right. Right. Sure. They yeah. just lived their lives however they wanted anyway. Yeah. But the the regulators in Arkansas don't think we're very intelligent about how they reacted. But how, how about Montana? We spent we spent quite a bit of time out in Montana here over the past you know few years yeah Mon- montana's cool uh, it's very remote of course like yeah. if you're very if you're happy being very remote and away from everything um i think yeah. good and you can get some ridiculously cheap property yeah uh, in montana there. also yeah yeah florida i mean florida i think one of the better states on their reaction their their behavior um you know texas was okay not amazing texas was okay um, North Carolina, I would say, depending on where you are in North yeah. Carolina, um, like where I'm at right now, Greensboro, people were idiots. People yeah. were idiots here. Like, um, but then, so I think Asheville was probably much better than the Greensboro area. I think Asheville did reasonably well. I was in Asheville, uh, actually one of our RV trips in the past year, we spent some time in oh, Asheville. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so awesome. I don't know. Yeah. If, if it was, if it were me and I was going to live in the States, which I'm not interested in, but right. if I were, um, I would pick something, you know, work wise, just make sure you have a, uh, location independent in source. You've got good internet and then pick something, you know, with, with a decent sized piece of land. I mean, no need to go, uh, thousand yeah. acre ranch in wyoming or anything like that but a couple acres of land maybe and kind of have your own space and kind of what you want yeah that would i love be that kind of my, yeah. my reaction to it i hear you loud and clear all right europe, so global yeah. i'll just tell you real quick though yeah, we're talking about countries europe i would say for the most part at least in the european union the eu part of europe mm-hmm. i would probably just stay away their their reactions and behavior has been crazy now, the non-EU part of Europe, like uh, Albania, Montenegro, Croatia. Well, Croatia is technically EU, but not Schengen zone. Um, uh, Bulgaria, which is also EU, but not Schengen. Uh, like basically in that kind of Balkan area of yeah. Europe, I think they did. They were pretty good. I think they did a good job uh, overall, especially comparatively to, let's say, the uh, Schengen part of Europe. You know what I mean by shame oh. zone? Go, go ahead and define it for the audience, please. That'd be great. Um, well, so in, in Europe, you have what you call Europe, which is the whole area, um, which, you know, like technically even like the UK is part of Europe, for example, but now mm-hmm. it's not in the EU and it's not in the shame zone. So these are treaties actually. So um, there are 27 countries in the EU, but there's only 19 that are in the Schengen zone. So, for example, Croatia is in the EU, Bulgaria is in the EU, but they're not in the Schengen zone. 
most of the silly restrictions were Schengen zone. So there are 19 yeah. countries. And this is pretty much all of your Western Europe, the Baltic states, um, th- that, that kind of area. Yeah, um, absolutely. No, <laughs> it's I, a travel I, treaty, basically. Yeah, I hear you loud and clear. Um, so, Bobby, Global Wealth Protection, you talked a little bit about why you founded it, um, kind of how you led there, uh, um, the path that led you there. So let, let's talk about more about what you do. So, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I reach out to you. I say, hey, Bobby, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm mobile. I do this. I have a business. I have some assets. Walk us through what your company does, how you help, how you help entrepreneurs, how you help individuals, um, and what okay. you do specifically. Yeah. So like we have a membership program, uh, GWP insiders where members can join. Um, and then we have a lot of content in there about different internationalization strategies, tax planning, trust, uh, trust, uh, like using offshore trust and private interest foundations, uh, company structure, how to optimize structures. Uh, we have information in there about second passport, second residencies, uh, second citizenship, foreign real estate, uh, some crypto related stuff in there. Um, and so there, it's a content, it's a membership program with content, but the big thing for the membership is my members get 30 minute consultations uh, where we can actually go one-on-one and dig into your situation. And because everybody's situation is completely different. And then also they get discounts on our other services like company formation, trust administration. Um, we do we do one big event a year and then one mastermind a year, so they have the opportunity to join us if they if they want to participate in those events. Um, are those so are those live or virtual? Live. We don't do virtual awesome. events. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Where are your not, events going to be this year? So we just did our big event in uh, Puerto Vallarta in February. Yeah our mastermind event coming up, uh, in Plato Carmen, Mexico. It's the end of August. Um, it's, I think we have a couple of seats left. We got a, I got a bunch of people that say they want to come, but they're not pulling the trigger on it. So at this moment, we still have a couple of seats left for mastermind and our mastermind's small. It's only 20 people, max 20. Um, and it is a very, it's a five day event, very hands on. Um, it's very, uh, no, we, there's no like prepared presentations. We come and the mastermind kind of develops based on the, uh, the attendees there. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. No, I think it's fantastic. I've, I've done masterminds like, well, one of our friends, Craig Ballantyne, you know, yeah. I loved how he kind of customizes it to the attendees. It's, it's just wonderful when you do it that way. So we, the way we do ours, basically it's a, it's a, over the course of four days, um, Technically six days, but you have to arrive the day before and leave the day after. So it's four sure, days yeah. in the middle. Um, but during the four days, um, I'm very, very, very adamant about uh, developing bonds and relationships with people. And so uh, I'll explain like this. Who, who are the people that you have your best relationships with? They're not the people that you just have an, a beer after work with once in a while. They're the people that you have a bonding moment with. Like you have, yeah. you went skydiving with, or you had a crazy yeah. uh, motorcycle trip with, or you. Yeah, down you the know, Grand Canyon. We got it. My buddies Grand and I Canyon three years trip. later. Yeah. We still text each other. You still talk stuff about every it every day. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And yeah. that's the kind of thing. What we do is half our day is a mastermind and half our day are adventure excursions. Love it. Love it. So yeah, we, we do like doing one thing. We're swimming with whale sharks. Um, this is one of the, one of our excursions we're doing. So we, super cool. we don't only sit around talking about business all the time. Like we're, yeah. we're also developing life, lifetime relationships. We've been doing this for like 15 years. So, um, not the mastermind part, but the event, the bigger event we've been doing for about 15 years. Yeah. So, but basically that kind of hands on to get back to your original question, hands on, um, what do we do? It, it depends on each person's situation. You might come to me and say, I got a, a location independent business and my goal is uh, anonymity. I, I, you know, maybe you sell uh, CBD products and so you want anonymity with your, your business. You don't want people connect. 
So, you know, we can restructure your business to kind of take your name off of everything. Maybe you come to me and say, look, like German, I, I'm, I'm a German guy with a e-commerce business in North America. And I live in whatever I said before, Thailand, I think. Um, I optimize that. Do I pay tax in Germany, the U.S., Thailand? How do I uh, structure that? And so uh, we come up with the strategy to a multi-jurisdictional approach normally to uh, figure that stuff out. As the world becomes globalized, the freedom increases, and also you know, you see kind of um, confisc- confiscatory. I think I'm saying that right. Uh, tax rates in some of these in some of these areas. This is this the, the service you provide is tremendously valuable. So you mentioned Global Wealth Insiders. Your website's globalwealthprotection.com, and yeah. I know you got a free training. So if people want to want to get that, what's the best way to check that out? Get a hold of you, learn more about what you do, Bobby. Yeah, Global Wealth Protection. Dot com. We've got a bunch of videos on there, a bunch of um, um, bunch of blogs and stuff like that. And I will tell you, Bobby's been very entertaining today. But I've listened to several of his blogs, read or read some of his blogs, listened to some of his podcasts <laughs> that he's been on. And if you enjoy what you heard today, listen to check out globalwealthprotection dot com, uh, get his free training, and also listen to some of his other interviews because he is a wealth of information, but also highly entertaining. If you ask me, and Bobby, well, I really appreciate you joining us today. You, you, if you think that's entertaining, you should send me a friend request on Facebook. This is like, <laughs> this is like my hobby. <laughs> My, my, my hobby is antagonistic uh, posts and memes on, on Facebook. It's, it's, it's just kind of a, 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 you, an emotional mental release. You got it. <laughs> you got it. So um, you, you mentioned earlier, you know, you, you, were, you were quite successful kind of in your late 20s, Bobby. If you go back to your 25-year-old self and give yourself a piece of advice, what would it be? Oh, um. If I was going to give my 25 year old self a piece of advice, um, keep an open mind and don't, don't accept what handed to you or, or given to you as information. Don't accept it as status quo. Just always question, right. always think for yourself, always keep an open mind. And, and and I bring that up. That really is advice I would give my 25 year old self because in my twenties, I think I was pretty minded. Um, and I just some, had some stupid ideas and some stupid thoughts. And I look back now and I'm like, Ugh, you were an idiot. You know, like, yeah, like a lot of us as we get older, right? When you're 20, you think you're the smartest thing in the world. Right. And, you think, yeah. and that, that 15 year old self was an idiot. Right. And right. then when you're 30, <laughs> the 20-year-old self was an idiot, but the 30-year-old self is a genius. Brilliant, yeah. The, the only thing I can say in my 40s, I realize that my 30-year-old or 25-year-old self is an idiot, but I also realize my 47-year-old self is very often an idiot. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love this it. This is Actually, my open-mindedness, yeah. right? This is my open-mindedness it. coming into play that I'm thinking like, a 25 year old self was dumb, but you know what? I'm pretty dumb now too. Sometimes, you know what? It's, I think it's great. You know, you, and, and I think it also allows you to have a little more fun with life. Take yourself less seriously. I Absolutely. gave my boys that, that same advice here recently. I said, listen, guys, you know, I, don't trust the government. Don't trust your teachers. Don't trust the news. You know, we were kind of talking about, um, a, a news, something that was on the news that, you know, was coming out there. And even like the Tom Brady deflate gate, you know, my son, I was like, Hey, where'd you hear that from? We were talking about that, whether you like Tom Brady or not like Tom Brady, I don't care. Um, but I told him, I said, even me, son, don't trust me, but figure it out for yourself and do that. So I love that advice, Bobby. Um, I told my so, kids the same thing. The number yeah. one thing I could teach my kids is to don't, is to question everything, even me. Question everything. That's right. I love it. I love it. Well, I'm going to leave it at that because I think that's phenomenal. And I, I look forward to having more conversations with you, Bobby. Again, globalwealthprotection.com. We'll have all the links uh, up on the show notes here today. And you can check Bobby Casey out, globalwealthprotection.com. Thanks for having me, Chris. Take care. Thank you, sir.